we go. Can you all hear me? Good morning. Happy Father's Day to all you fathers. And we have a few announcements this morning. Good to be back here giving announcements. Uh, we don't want to forget James tonight. Ice cream, 6 o'clock. Be there, be square, right? We want to pray for the youth on their trip to West Virginia. Today they leave right after the service. And a special prayer for Pastor Steve, who's got to sleep on a cot in the church. <laughs> be good. Uh, also, uh, Stephen's ministry is going to be giving, is doing the coffee hour this morning, and I was over there, and you ought to see all the stuff, all the food. So don't forget to uh, go and join him over there, help eat some of that food. We'd like to welcome uh, Beth Ross to uh, our council, and uh, I'm sure she'll she'll be a good uh, asset to it. Uh, one thing uh, I want to talk about is uh, the, from the property committee is we're trying to get uh, well, Jane is persons trying to get enough people to do some weeding. Now we had five people here on Friday, and four of them were over seven. What's wrong with this picture, right? <laughs> so uh, she's trying to assign everybody to a spot. In other words, uh, I think Rhonda and Bud have the spot over by the lighthouse as you come in, the big spot, but they could use some, two more people or another person. And you come anytime you want. You know, whenever you feel like coming, you just come and pull your little heart out with weeds, you know? So. Uh, we uh, really, really do need to help to keep our property uh, in, in good shape. And Joe is doing a fantastic job with, with grass cutting and, and uh, trimming. And thanks, Joe, for that. You're making me really look bad there. But, uh, I'm glad you're doing it. Uh, and uh, last, uh, there was an old couple driving home from church. And the woman looks over to her husband and says, did you see that Mrs. Wilson's dress, how short it was? Husband looked at her and said, no, I didn't see it. Go a little further and she said, how about that Mrs. Urban, her hairdo? Can you, did you see that? No, didn't see that either. She looks at him and says, boy, a lot of good it did you to go to church. <laughs> Pastor Gilbert's going to give us a uh, speech on Stephen's ministry. It'll be a short speech. Um, so, we have a Stephen ministry group at this church. Stephen ministers do not happen by accident. Um, I just want to tell you a little bit about Stephen ministry. Um, and we're not just about coffee hour, although we're doing a coffee hour every other month to remind you that you have Stephen ministers. Um, Stephen ministry began um, with a pastor in St. Louis who was trying to find a way to meet the needs of preparing the sermon and also uh, providing care to parishioners. And uh, at one point he found himself he's a, a licensed clinical psychologist and his wife I'll just keep talking. Um, it might be a long speech after all. Um, so at one point he was sitting in a cafe with two seminary students who wanted to intern in his congregation because they knew he was a clinical psychologist. As they talked about the difficulties of providing pastoral care to everyone who needed it, they came up with an idea that would eventually grow into a ministry spanning oil. The question was, what if we trained lay people to do one-to-one, -one, distinctively Christian caring ministry with those going through difficult times in life? What would that look like? Uh, so the first class of student ministers in Dr. Kempoff's congregation had nine people in it. They were folks like you find in any church, like you find here, as 
secretary, a teacher, a student, a hairdresser, a business owner. After they were trained and commissioned, they began their ministry, and those student ministers saw the power of what they were doing, of the difference they were making in the lives of those they cared for, and insisted that Dr. Howe share the ministry with other congregations. So in 1975, Dr. Hauck and his wife Joan, who was a psychiatric nurse and a clinical social worker, founded Stephen Ministries St. Louis. Um, Christ Hamilton has been participating. I was in the second class of Stephen Ministers to be commissioned. Um, Stephen Ministers go through a 50-hour training period. We are, um, what we're trained to do is listen and what we're trained to do is to protect the confidentiality of our care receivers. And we form a relationship with our care receivers that is for three people. It is for our care, it is for the caregiver, it is for the care receiver, and it is for Christ, the caregiver. So when someone is struggling, uh, we, the Stephen ministers in this church love you all so much and we look at the world a little bit differently because we've been trained to look for need and we've been trained to listen very carefully so when a person is stuck in a loss in an illness uh, in, in their anger sometimes it's too much Sometimes they don't want to share it with family and friends anymore because they feel like they're a burden. Sometimes they don't know where to go for community resources for what they need. Well, guess what, Stephen Ministers? This is what this ministry is for. It's for someone to come alongside a person that's struggling in a confidential relationship. And the person, the caregiver, the Stephen Minister, doesn't operate alone, they operate with the support of the other Stephen ministers. So Stephen ministers go through a 50 hour training program. They commit to a two year term as a volunteer, which they can choose to renew or step away from as they go forward. Um, and they listen very carefully and compassionately without judgment. They're not, not there to fix their care receiver they're there to encourage and witness and reflect Christ's love to their care receiver, to help with prayer, to help with identifying resources as a care receiver is solving a problem or working through a situation. They are there for support. Um, and it's a very cool thing. Um, I've been doing this since maybe 2014, I think. I came to be a, a student minister because I had begun, uh, after I'd been the caregiver for my parents and they had passed and I had experienced uh, the support of hospice, I ended up becoming a hospice volunteer and I would volunteer at the house. And then student ministry came to this congregation and I looked at it for a little while and it kept bringing a little bell inside. This is a direction you're growing in anyway. Learn the Lord. So the, the becoming a student minister, the equipping of a student minister, those skills, those tools, I take into every relationship and every communication I have uh, going forward. It's, it's kept me in work. It's helped me in the fire walk. It's helped me with my dealing with, with family, loving with family. It has helped me with strangers in the grocery store. Um, so the, the equipping that student ministry gives people is an awesome tool. Uh, but being willing to recognize that you're hurting and that maybe you need the support of a student minister at a time in your life. Uh, people know the bonds that are formed in student ministry we love our care receivers forever, but they outgrow their need for the relationship, which means that the caregivers are free to take on new relationships. And you would be surprised at the number of student ministers that are caregivers now, but they were care receivers once because they 
still have a value from the program. Don't be afraid. Don't sit there in the pew and with a heavy heart because you hurt. You are not alone. We are here to support you. So um, we're not just about coffee hour, but we'll be there. Um, I can't find my name tag, otherwise I'd be wearing it. In fact, I have two, and I can't find either of them. But the Stephen ministers are wearing blue name tags today if they have found theirs. And uh, we are an ongoing ministry to support them. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. O oh God, we bring before you the cries of a sorrowing world. In your mercy, set us free from the chains that bind us and defend us from everything that is evil. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Amen. from the 65th chapter of Isaiah. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that, that did not call on my name. I held out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and offering incense on bricks, who sit inside tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh with broth of abominable things in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day long. See, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. <clears throat> I will indeed repay into their laps their iniquities and their ancestors' iniquities together, says the Lord, because they offered incense on the mountains and reviled me on the hills. I will measure into their laps full payment for their actions. Thus says the Lord, as the wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it, so will I do for my servants' sake, and not destroy them all. I will, begin, I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah, inheritors of my mountains. My chosen shall inherit it, and my servants shall settle there. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. A reading from the third chapter of Galatians. Now before faith came, we were imprisoned and guarded under the law until faith would be revealed. Therefore, the law was our disciplinary until Christ came, so that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer subject to a disciplinary, for in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. As many of you as were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The word of the, the, word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke, the eighth chapter. Glory to the Lord. Then Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite of Galilee. As he stepped out onto, a land, uh, onto the land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house, but rather in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him, and he shouted, at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High, God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirits to come out of the man. 
For many times it had seized him, he was kept under guard and was bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the, by the demon into the wilds. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there along the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these so he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and they told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by the demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So Jesus got in the boat and returned. The man for whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with them, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. As we enter into the season of Sundays after Pentecost, it's 24 Sundays long. Half of our church year. The liturgical year is made up of two areas of primary focus, the life of Jesus, which we explore from Advent through Easter, and then the rest. So after being filled with the spirit on the day of Pentecost, we now shift our sole focus on Jesus to asking ourselves how we are going out as a congregation and being God's hands and feet in the world. No longer are the chosen frozen. They are now in the liturgical year, so to speak, set free to be loosed upon the world. Worship has long been held in high regard in the Lutheran Church and while you might think it's the most important thing, it doesn't compare to potluck, does it? Or coffee hour. Actually, you know, it does. Worship is crucial to our life together. It's not that fellowship isn't important. It was number one on your survey last week, followed by Christian education and youth. But worship is where it begins and ends, and it is the rhythm of our life together as a congregation. Worship reminds us God is there to hear our morning cry. He'll be there to hear our last. It is when we are assured that we go to a place with no tears, no more crying, and no more pain. And we gathered on Monday to sing and to pray and to laugh and to re reflect upon Lou's life. And it was so right to do so. It was a celebration of Lou's life, a life that was centered on the love of God and family. It is in worship that we gather together as a people of God to laugh and to cry, and yes, to try to make sense of what it means to follow Jesus in a world where gas is over $5 a gallon and children get shot in our schools. In this church, we call ourselves liturgical, which means we follow an ordered way of service. And so whenever we gather, we have a fourfold pattern of gathering, word, meal, and then sending. We gather together in song. We read scripture and hear a message of God's word then we gather for communion. Why? So that after hearing the word, we can be sustained by the love of God, and then we are sent into the world. 
Next week, we will have an opportunity not a lot of congregations have. We are celebrating 50 years of the life of a pastor and leading the worship life of congregations. And so as I thought of how we worship today and the news all around us, I would encourage you to see in worship, especially for Pastor Ritter Push, 50 years of leading worship and knowing that in our words, through our scripture and through our song, how we worship, it grounds us and it gives us expression to what we believe. You said those words. Lord, speak to us so that we might speak. Lead us so that we might lead and teach us, Lord, so that we may teach. Well, enough on worship. But we all need reminders that this is where it all begins and ends, both in our lives as individuals and as congregations. Within worship, the pastor, of course, is invited to reflect upon the appointed scriptures for the day, and so we turn to the Gospel of Luke for our Sundays after Pentecost. What do you know about the Gospel of Luke? This Gospel is usually called the third Gospel, and its author is thought to have been a companion of Paul and the one who also wrote the book of Acts. Where the Gospel of Mark is short and to the point, Luke's in style and in structure is intentional in pairing Jesus' story with the story of the emerging church. So what, Pastor? Who cares? Well, we, get, we do. We care. Or we should. Because each of the authors of our Gospels it encourages us to see Jesus' life from their point of view. The good news for you is in the next 20 plus Sundays after Pentecost, I won't need to tell you any more about the author of Luke. Unless, of course, you want a class on him. And if you do, I'd be happy to oblige. So we've hit worship, we've hit liturgy. Time to hit the text in our Gospel of Luke. When Jesus steps out of the boat opposite Galilee, today he steps into a real life and death drama. A garrison man runs to meet him. He is in every way, in every way unclean. He is driven by a legion of demonic forces. This man is scarcely human anymore. He lives in the tombs among the dead. He is naked, unpredictable, violent, and totally alone. And then Jesus steps out of the boat. Jesus doesn't care about being made unclean by this man. What he cares about is the man. Jesus doesn't care what others might think in the midst of stepping into all of these social and religious wrongs of his day, Jesus instead just does the right thing. He heals the man, he banishes evil, he shakes up the local population, he changes the landscape, and he leaves an enduring visible sign and vocal sign of his work. This crazed man becomes the first missionary to the Gentiles. Did you notice, though, the townspeople chose fear over faith? Did you catch it? And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized by great fear. I wonder if we've gotten into that pattern ourselves. COVID has caused many to lock down and stay seated down. Some haven't re-engaged with neighbors or church for fear of disease. We've gotten into patterns of non-community. 
We binge watch and have everything picked up at a curb or dropped off at our house. We design our homes without front porches and instead build in closed in decks and fenced in backyards. But you know, we are made to be in community and in fellowship with others. As a congregation, part of our purpose is not just fellowship on the inside, but fellowship with others on the outside. Giving to others like our knitters shared last week do you know that our knitters were the number two producer of lamb's wool ministry items on the East Coast? That's something to celebrate. This week we'll be in community with those in West Virginia for a week. As we look to the future, community involves partnering with our neighbors and neighboring churches to see that God's love is shared. Well, number one priority from the survey was fellowship, and number three was outreach and partnership. Our priorities will help to forge the future direction here. We'll need to respond in faith moving forward and not in fear. If we respond just in fear, we might as well just tell Jesus to get the boat and to leave. Martin Luther King Jr. shared the following from a sermon given in 1968. He said, every now and then I think about my own death and I think about my own funeral and I don't think of it in a morbid sense. And every now and then I ask myself, what is it that I once said? And I leave this word with you this morning. If any of you are around when I have to meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. And if you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them, well, don't talk too long. Every now and then I wonder what I want them to say. Tell them not to mention that I have the Nobel Peace Prize. That isn't important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or four hundred other awards. It's not important at all. Tell them not to mention even where I went to school. Instead, I would like someone to mention that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. That's all I really want to say. We follow the one who loves unconditionally. From those tormented by demons to those who have been the model of our godly lives. So let us be a people dedicated to doing the same. We sing, they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Loving not just the ones who are lovable, but especially those who think they are absolutely beyond the love of God.
We confess our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the church, the creation, and all in need. Holy God, you hear the cries of those who seek you. Equip your church with evangelists who reveal the continuous call of your outstretched hands and your promise of a home in you. God of grace, hear our prayer. You hear the cries of the earth. Restore places where land, air, and waterways have been harmed. Guide us to develop and implement sources of energy and food production, but do not destroy the earth. God of grace, hear our prayer. You hear the cries of those who are marginalized or cast out. Guide us continually toward the end of oppression in all forms. Bring true freedom and human flourishing to all your beloved children. God of grace, hear our prayer. You hear the cries of those who suffer. Come to the aid of those who are homeless, naked, hungry, and sick, especially those in need of prayer we raise to you now. Bring peace to any experiencing mental illness that they can clearly recognize your loving presence. God of grace, you hear the cries of those who celebrate and those who grieve on this Father's Day. Nurture mutual love and tender care in all relationships. Comfort those for whom this day brings sadness or longing. God of grace, we give thanks for the faithful departed whose lives proclaimed all you had done for them. At the last, Unite us with them as we make our home in you. God of grace, hear our prayer. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in our hearts into your holy keeping. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Merciful God, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have have first given given us, our selves, our our time, time, and our our possessions, possessions, signs of your your gracious love. love. Receive them them for the sake of him who offered himself for us. Jesus Jesus Christ, Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in every place give thanks and praise to you. Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, opened to us the way of everlasting life. So with all the choirs of angels, the church on earth, and all the hosts of heaven, we praise your name, and we join their unending hymn. The night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and ga- gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, it's my body, which I have given for you. Do this always for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this always for the remembrance of me. We share together with the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation,
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and always keep you in his grace. Amen. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. And we pray that in your mercy you would strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This time I would invite all of the uh, folks who are going on the uh, West Virginia trip to come forward. You guys can kind of just stand along there. That's cool. You can make funny faces at them if you want to. <laughs> As we're making our way down, and I think there are some in the balcony that are still coming down. Um, just, uh, just a heads up, we need to take off rather quickly after the church service because we're supposed to be in uh, West Virginia in a timely fashion. Uh, we may be heating up food. Uh, but if you would, uh, kids, hit the lighthouse bathroom first, okay? <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then if you will make way for them to hit coffee hour just briefly for them to go through and then right into the van. Got it? All right, good. It's a start. We'll get there by the end of the week. <laughs> A reading from 1 Peter. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you have received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking with the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies, so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. In the presence of this assembly, will you serve the people of Charleston with the love and with the grace of God? Will you be faithful, understanding, and loving as you accompany those who you work, who you will live and who you will work with? And this is when you guys will want a bulletin in front of you, but that's okay. Just pay attention to Bob. Okay, we'll have Bob go first. Uh, so the reply is, I will and I ask God to help me. I will and I ask God to help me. I will and I ask God to help me. I will and I ask God to help me. I will and I ask God to help me. I will and I ask God to help me. I will and I ask God to help me. I will and I ask God to help me. May Almighty God, who has given you the will to do these things, graciously give you the strength and the compassion to perform them. Amen. People of God, will you support these messengers of Jesus Christ? Sent by God to serve all people with the gospel of hope and salvation. Will you pray for them, help and honor them for their work's sake, and in all things strive to live in peace and in unity in Christ? We will and we ask God to help us. Let us pray. Almighty God, you sent your Son Jesus Christ to reconcile the world to yourself. We praise and bless you for those whom you send to witness in word and in deed among the people of Charleston. Bless them in the work you have called them to do, so that they may faithfully accompany those whom they are sent. Show your love to all people and glorify your name, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Amen. May the God of peace, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life this day and always. Amen. All right, guys, you are out of here. Okay. <laughs> Uh, choir, come on down. And the, switch places with the choir. You're, you're leaving? Well, yeah, you guys can hang out till the end of the service and then.
in peace. Love your neighbor. Thank you.